Uh, David Henry Jr. Tell a little bit about his story. He's from Rochester, New York. He joined the United States Army at 17. And David, one of the things that we do here at NAMI is we always acknowledge our military, so thank you for your service. So uh, when he, I'm sitting there, I'm listening, he mentions that he grew up in Rochester, New York. Our, our daughter was born in Rochester, New York, so I'm, you know, the, the cameras are on, lights are on, he's sitting across from me, and I don't know he's a military veteran, I don't know he's from Rochester, um, and I don't know that he was shot at 19 by a sniper, and I don't know that he's a Purple Heart winner, but what I do know is that he is with DeKalb County NAMI, and he is the president of DeKalb County NAMI. So we talk about we, we talk about servant leadership. So he served us in the military at war, and he came back and decided to serve us at Nani. And what I'd like to do is to now invite David up, David Kendrick Jr. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. Yes, I am from Rochester, New York. Go Bills. <laughs> Squish the fish. Um, one, one moment here, um, and I'd like to thank Dan for giving me that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm going to tell a story today. I'm trying to pull up my, my slides here as well that uh, I've never told before. I've been doing this for a very long time, a very long time, and uh, today is going to be the first day that I tell stories, things that you may see in movies or things that um, you may hear from other veterans and say, I can't believe that happened, but I went through it. And there's something that we at NAMI, in order to be a leader or a president or to uh, facilitate any program, you have to have something called a lived experience with mental illness. And today I'm going to share with you guys my lived experience. Next slide. <sighs> joined the Army at 17 years old out of Rochester, New York. Now, I joined in 2005. And I didn't join for any real big patriotic reason, even though the, the war in Iraq was underway. I'm from New York. 9-11 um, happened in my home state. I was a 17-year-old kid confused about life. I wasn't good at school, as, a, as good as I was at football. I loved to play football. I wanted to go to the University of Buffalo to play football, then get drafted by the Buffalo Bills didn't happen at all because my GPA said otherwise. So it came to a, a time when my dad said, they called me Junior back home, Junior, what are you gonna do with your life? And I said, I know what I'm not gonna do. I'm not gonna be staying here with you <laughs> because me and my dad always butted heads. So one day while on the way home from school on the city bus, I saw a recruiting station for the army and I said, that's it. And I pulled the cord, I got off the bus, and I walked into that recruiting station, and my, sar my um, recruiter's name was Sergeant Soto. I said, Sergeant Soto, I want to join the Army. And everybody's jaw just dropped. Because in Rochester, 17-year-old black kids don't line up to join the Army. And so we had a long conversation, what do you want to do? And I was a wild kid, and I said, I want to do, I want to fight on the front line. During the war, I like to play football. I wrestled in high school, full of testosterone and adrenaline. I want to come back with a story to tell. So I joined the Army as a 19 Delta, a Cavalry Scout. And if you're not familiar with uh, Cavalry Scouts, there was a famous group of African American soldiers called the Buffalo Soldiers, which were one of the first groups, if not the first group, of African American veterans to serve in the military. And I'm very proud to be of that lineage. Next slide. That was me. I uh, got assigned to 361st Cavalry Regiment out of Fort Carson, Colorado. 
and we went to Iraq in 2006. And during this time, the war, it was horrible for everybody involved. We were losing a lot of soldiers. But in the military, I gained something that I never had in Rochester. And it, it built this great foundation for me that I gained, I gained discipline. People respected me. I felt like a somebody. Go to the next slide. I had these great friends, friends that to, to this day are still my very best friends. Best friends I've had my entire life. Things that I didn't have in Rochester. My life had purpose, my life had meaning, my life had direction, and my life, more importantly, had a future. And I was with these other guys on the front lines, and I don't know who's ever served in the military or been a part of any law enforcement or anything like that, but in the military, we build these bonds that are unlike anything else. Because these guys on my front truck, we have each other's lives in our hands. I knew their wives. I knew their children. I knew who they had to come home to. And I knew that what I did protected them. If I messed up, they may not be able to come home to see their wife again or to see their children again. We even went to church in Iraq. Believe it or not, they have military service on post. And we went to church every single Sunday in Iraq. And it was unlike anything that I've ever, ever, ever had before in my life. Then life turned upside down for me. Because in 2007, it was reported as the bloodiest year of the war. We lost 800 and 99 soldiers that year. And in my unit, I deployed when I was 19 years old. And I started losing friends. And it impacted the entire unit. But what it, what it did for me, because I was something called the lead scout, I was out in front of everybody else driving in the platoon, it made me feel like I wasn't gonna come back to see my own mom. Because I don't know how many moms we have out here, but I'm my mom's oldest child and I'm her only son. So you can imagine her feelings when she saw me join the army and then found out what I was going to do and then I get deployed to Iraq. And then on June 17th, 2007, I got shot by a sniper. The bullet hit my femoral artery, it broke my left leg, and since we got ambushed, I don't know if you ever seen Full Metal Jacket, but the sniper, he didn't shoot to kill me, he shot to wound. So my truck commander, he ran up to me, he jumped on top of me, and two guys jumped out of a pickup truck with AK-47s, and they started shooting at me again on the ground, and I got shot again in my right leg and he got hit in his forearm and in his head. And June 17th, 2007 shaped my life forever when it came to my personal mental health back challenges and my lived experience. That there's an entry wound, that's the exit wound. It shattered everything. It clipped my sciatic nerve. I could no longer move the toes on my left foot. I had to be in physical therapy for three and a half years. That's me when I was 20 years old, still my mom's baby. It took 14 surgeries while in the hospital just to, just to save my leg because they had to cut my pants off in the middle of the street and a bunch of damp sand and dirt and rocks got in the wound and I caught a really bad blood infection and on top of all the swelling in my leg, so what you see down there in the lower half of my leg is called compartment syndrome. Because if you know anything about combat lifesavers training, the first thing you have to do is stop the bleed. So when I got hit my femoral artery, it took two tourniquets to stop the bleeding on my left leg. And my left leg ballooned to almost four times its natural size. And they had to cut my leg on both sides here on my left leg just to reduce the swelling and then suck out the infection in my leg. I couldn't eat anything, I couldn't drink anything, 
All I could drink was that intro you see there. And when is the last time you seen a CD player? <laughs> <laughs> All I could do was listen to music. And while I'm in the hospital, I found out the very next day, my best friend, Erica Marcinell, was shot and killed by a sniper in the same area. And this is my roommate in Iraq. This is my roommate back on Fort Carson. This was my best friend. We knew, I knew everything about him, everything about his sons. And I had my first experience with PTSD called survivor's guilt. Here I am, laying in the hospital with my own injuries, wishing that I was dead and my friend was still alive. And that survivor's guilt, it ate me up for years. Because as I saw his children get older, all I could think about was, they don't have their father. And here I am, I don't have any children, still don't have any children. My mom would have missed me, of course, but my friends, they didn't grow up without their dad. Next slide. Then came the physical therapy, because I had something in my left foot called plantar fasciitis. And if you know anything about that, it burns the bottom of your left foot. I had severe muscle atrophy, and doctors told me that we don't know the extent of your injuries because when you have nerve damage along with the amount of muscle atrophy that I had in my left leg, it takes years to regenerate. And after about a year, they found out that, you know, due to my injury on my sciatic nerve, I wasn't going to be able to move my toes again. Next slide. Along with the physical injuries that I had, this is me taking my first steps about a month after my injuries. Mentally in my mind, I thought, if I put any, leg, if put, put, put any pressure on my left leg, my leg is gonna break again. Because all I could think about is my left leg with that broken femur laying down in Iraq in a pool of my own blood and my body was just twisted. My toes were in a direction that I couldn't even imagine was humanly possible. So doctors were telling me, well David, today you need to take your first steps. You need to start walking. Your recovery starts now. But up here, I couldn't do it. Because all I could think about was my leg breaking and seeing my toes pointing in that same direction that they were when I was laying on the ground on June 17th, 2007. And that's my mom there trying to be as strong as she can for me in the hospital. Um, and she found out I had lost my best friend because she knew all of my friends as well. And she just kept saying, Junior, be strong. Junior, be strong. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And um, she was trying to be strong for me. And uh, I was losing it in the hospital. And then another problem began that it followed me for years, even after I got out of the hospital. Opioid addiction. As you can see here, I am completely out of it. Out of it. I was hooked up to morphine for three and a half months. Different medications had to take, obviously all the side effects of being on these opioids, had to take stool softeners and a plethora of other drugs. And they were complete gaps in time that I don't remember because I was so high on opioids. And the doctors saw it was a problem, but there was nothing that they could do because I, I needed these medications to deal with the pain. And after my three and a half months in the hospital, I eventually went to a unit called the WTU. And the WTU is a unit for injured soldiers that are thinking about transitioning back into civilian life or that want to try to do what we call a reclass. Since I wasn't able to serve in a combat capacity anymore, you, I would be able to go in and do something else for the Army. Then I got sent to this unit and things got considerably worse because now I'm in this unit with other soldiers whose bodies are broken. 
their minds are broken. And my unit came back from Iraq, and the war was still really, really, really bad. So they had to go back to Afghanistan in 2009. And in 2009, my unit was ambushed. And I lost a very, very, very close friend of mine, Michael Scusa. And while I'm dealing with my own PTSD, my own survivor's guilt, I lose even more friends who had family members, who had children. So with these other soldiers, we hit the bottle and we hit it hard. When you go to any military or civilian mental health provider, they always ask you a question. How much are you drinking? And I say, I don't know. I drink a lot. I was drinking straight out the bottle to deal with what I was going through because I didn't, I didn't have any coping skills at that time. My lived experience was nothing but pain. My physical pain my emotional pain, still losing friends. I was around 22 years old at this time and my life had no direction because that foundation that was built in the military, that discipline, all of my friends, my future in the military, it was uncertain. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know if I was gonna be able to stay in the military, didn't know if I was gonna be able to leave, didn't know the extent of my injuries at the time because I was still sporadically having surgeries because I was on crutches and sometimes I would fall and do injury and do even more damage to my leg that was than I had already done. And during this time when you're going through these stages, a lot of soldiers go through this but they don't know exactly how to talk about it. You're a danger to yourself and everyone around you. And the thing about being in this state of mind, this lived experience of mine, alcoholics are gonna find other alcoholics to hang with. People who abuse pills are gonna find other people to abuse pills and hang out with. And when you're drunk all the time like I was, everything seems like a good idea. And I look back at these times now and by God's, God's grace and mercy, I never had a DUI never got into a car crash, never did anything as a result of alcohol that would have cost me my life or anyone else their life. Next slide. And this is the video you can play at 32.53. So anybody know about a training call or a therapy called EMDR? This is my EMDR therapy sessions. I'll just let this play for a little bit here. It's sad, you know, and I was mad, you know, like, what did this happen to me? What did I do? Okay. Man. Sad feeling, you know, and sometimes I still feel that today because, you know, I can't do everything I used to do. Um, sad feeling. <laughs> uh, I know. Like, don't be this feeling, why I It's everything I feel, it's always in my chest. It's always in my chest. You know, it's like, I don't want to say my heart, you know, but it, 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 that's what it feels like. That. Yeah. It, you know, um, it just, you just go ahead and close your eyes mm -hmm. and you shift your attention to your chest where that silence is. Just stay with it. Okay, you can stop it there. Just let your body. My major, most major PTSD symptom that still stays with me to this day, getting shot by a sniper, it happens so fast. I didn't, know who, I, I didn't know who shot me. To this day, I still don't know. So in my mind, even though I went through all of this EMDR therapy, I still think that my sniper is somewhere out there waiting to finish the job. 
and I have scenarios in certain places that I avoid because I still think that the sniper's gonna kill me. And a couple of like couple of years after my injury, it was so, so it was at the front of my mind. I couldn't go outside. I couldn't imagine doing anything like this, being on the stage, because I always thought that the sniper would be somewhere just waiting to pull the trigger. And it took years and years and years for me to get over that. And even though I went through this EMDR training and other types of therapy, it still comes to right here in front of my mind when I'm in certain scenarios. It took a long time for me to be able to get on stage and speak because the bigger the audience, in my mind, that was the more people that was gonna be in the audience just to shoot and kill me. And I was being tortured because in my mind, I created a scenario, the sniper didn't kill me because he wanted to torture me. He wanted me to live longer and live this life and do better things in life and get to greater and achieve greater things. And then at that moment, he would strike. So the more successful I got, even as a speaker, I was more, even more and more afraid to speak to the point where I was turning down large audiences because I couldn't, I couldn't be on stage and just be a target. And this training helped me get through that. And eventually I was able to go out and live a normal life because this, this type of PTSD that I had, it impacts my life as well. Because there was, there's a, a portion of PTSD that no one talks about, and it's the desensitization being removed from your feelings. Not feeling love toward anything, not feeling hate toward anything, not even myself. And that's why it was so easy for me to get drunk and not care and break up with every girlfriend that I ever had, get in arguments with my mom, get in arguments with my sister, because I didn't care about anything because going to Iraq, seeing all that death, getting shot myself, losing my best friends, it took away all of my emotions. It stripped everything that I had as a human being. Go to the next slide. Then I moved home. I decided to move back to Rochester and this feeling got even worse because now I didn't have the military. Even when I was in that unit for injured soldiers, I was still in the army. I still had friends. Even though we only got drunk and got high together, I still had friends. I still had people around me that I could talk about going to the chow hall with, going to Iraq with, doing stuff in the military that you can't do anywhere else. And now back in Rochester, I have none of that. At 23 years old, I'm back home and I'm seeing drug dealers and gang members living better lives than me. People that I left behind, things that I left behind were living better lives than I was. So I hit the bottle harder. I did more pills. And then I got a letter from New York State, this letter here, the print is small, but what that letter says, David Kendrick, thank you for your application for unemployment, but an able to be considered for unemployment, you have to be willing and able to work. Your D214 says you are medically retired due to a disability. Therefore, you don't qualify for unemployment because you cannot get back to work. The same country I went and defended, got shot for, is now telling me, because you're disabled, because you went out, you don't qualify for unemployment. So I became even more removed from my feelings. I hit the bottom even harder. My PTSD got even worse because now I didn't care about anything. I didn't care about anyone. And if you're from Rochester, New York, there's a very, very high uh, Muslim population. So you hear Arabic in New York City, they call them bodegas. We just call them a corner store. But if you go into a corner store, it's highly likely you're going to hear someone speaking Arabic. And that drove me over the edge. I was mad at the world. 
I was upset. I didn't know where my place was in Rochester. Didn't know where my place was in the world. I had no feelings toward my mom. Here I am teaching my sisters how to ride their bike for the first time, but I had no feelings toward them. And this is one time when, one of two times when I felt afraid of myself. Because you may see these, you may see actors play these roles in movies. You may see people talk about it. But for me, this was real. And this next slide is me at the height of my mental illness, something that I've never talked about before. I've never told anyone before. You see it played out in movies. Um, you may see it in manifestos after something crazy has happened on television. But for me, during the summer of 2010, this is my real life. I had a Glock 45 that I bought when I was in the military. And I had this military training. I had pills. I had alcohol. I had no one that cared about me. I had PTSD. And I had what I thought was a sniper still trying to come after me. So I would go around with all of these plans that I made as a Calvary Scout because what we do is we just sit and observe things. All we do is sit and observe and we act on it. And I had all these different plans in my head and I had nobody to tell me that nothing was a good idea. Nobody said, nobody knew even what to say to me. Nobody said, David, you shouldn't be thinking like this. You shouldn't be talking like this. And when I was home, all my dad was telling me, Junior, you need to forget about the military. You back home now. I wanted to hurt him. I wanted to hurt all these different people. I wanted to hurt myself. And I didn't know what to do to get to make myself feel better. And so one day, I said, I, I can't do this, man. I can't do this. Because these thoughts, they became more intrusive, more intrusive, more intrusive. And the more I drank, the, the voice got louder in my head and said, do it. Do it. Hurt everybody. Hurt yourself. Nobody loves you. You went to war. You got shot. Nobody cares. Your country said that you're disabled. You don't qualify for unemployment. Do it all and then just kill yourself. And that voice kept getting louder and louder and louder. And I couldn't do it to anybody else. All these plans that I had made, all these maps that I had drawn out, I couldn't do it. And I tried to kill myself one day. And it didn't work. And this is when things turned around for me because, who's the next guy? I drove myself to the hospital after my attempt, and the first face that I saw was my mom. And right then and right there, I saw the impact that suicide would have on my family. And I said, I can't do this to my mom. I can't do this to my mom. And she said, Junior, I don't care how big you is, you bringing your butt to church. <laughs> because as you know, in the African-American community, the first thing we do, we gonna pray. And we gonna come to church. And so I get to church with my mom and slowly, 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 things start turning around. I get a job at this program called the Warrior Salute Program. Because at this time, I wasn't living with my dad because I couldn't stay there with him because as that voice got louder and louder and louder, he was the only one telling me, forget about the army, forget about the army, do something else. And that voice just kept getting louder, louder, louder. So I had to leave home. So I would, I would live in my car on the streets rather than live with him. 
and then this program, they brought me in in Webster, New York. They gave me a job at a spice factory, helping people with disabilities get back on their feet. And then that's when things suddenly clicked for me. I said, David, these people were born with these developmental disabilities since the beginning of their life, and they come to work every day with a smile on their face. Nothing gets them down. And that's when life started to change for me. And then I finally found my purpose in this program because I heard other veterans going through the same thing that I was going through. But then something clicked and I said, well, you sound just like me three months ago. And if you know, in the veteran population, we love weapons and they would show off their weapons and things like that in this program in group therapy. And I said, stop. I know the road you're headed down and it's full of nothing but bad things for you and everybody that you love. So in this program, somebody said, well, David, you do a really good job at telling your story to these veterans. You should try to tell it on the stage. And so I did, and after, after getting off stage, so many people would come up to me and say, man, I have a son, or I have a daughter, or I went through the same thing. And then that's when I started to feel like David Kendrick again, like my life had purpose. So I went to this program called the uh, Entrepreneurship Boot Camp for Veterans out of Syracuse University. And then I moved down to Atlanta, A-Town, uh, ended up getting my degree and um, make it, making a man out of myself, finally becoming David Kendrick, the person instead of living in David Kendrick, the, show, the soldier's shadow. And things just started to get so better for me, especially in Atlanta because of the military support that they have down there. It's a bigger city. As, the, as much as I love Rochester, you can outgrow a city, and you can outgrow the people you grow up with. You can even outgrow your own family. So I would say never be afraid to leave because you can always go back <laughs> and watch the bills on TV even in Atlanta. <laughs> Next slide. I even wrote a book about my time in Iraq, currently getting it made into a movie, fingers crossed. It's called Calvary on Amazon. Make sure you Google that. But <laughs> what this book allowed me to do, my best friend, Eric Lamar Snell, that passed away, I put him in this book so he's never gone. He's always here with us. He's always here. And to bring things around full circle, my friend's son is in the Army now. And I sent him a copy of this book when he was in Iraq. And he said, David, thank you. Because you gave me a piece of my dad that I didn't have. And my survivor's guilt just, it went away. Because his son was okay. And I had something to do with that. And hopefully as this book gains momentum, um, we can put this thing, get it made into a movie and you know help other people who's ever lost someone. Then through my lived experience, I wanted to help other people. So I got certified in something called mental health first aid. And using my skills and some type of magic clairvoyance that I have here, um, knowing other people who are going through a, a hard time mentally, during COVID-19, during the height of the pandemic, I was able to serve on the Georgia uh, mental health support line and help these people who were going through their own mental health crisis people who had COVID, people who had just lost their family, family members in New York and California and couldn't get back home. It was me sharing my lived experience with other people and helping them develop coping skills that I didn't have. Knowing people who abuse pills, abuse alcohol like I did, who don't have people who just know what they're going through and don't know what to say. This mental health first aid training helped me get that training. Then I found out about this wonderful program, this organization called NAMI. And I said, what the hell is NAMI? 
And somebody told me about it. And as I went on to school, I got my master's degree, I got my MBA in project management, and I was doing all these wonderful things. Um, I was working for a major Fortune 500 company, and I said, no, I need to do something bigger and better than this. I want to help, first of all, my community because I love DeKalb County, and mental illness is what I've been living with for the past 10 years. Because just because you feel better for a couple of months, maybe even years, that mental illness doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. You see, we have one of the songs that I learned in church <laughs> from our church folks in here. Those, that mental health it has peaks and valleys. And there's a song that says, I've had my good days. <laughs> I've had my heels to climb. Yeah. And, those, and those peaks and those valleys, when you go through mental health, man, those valleys aren't as low when you have the, support, the proper support around you. But those hills are higher because you've been there and now you can bring other people out of their valleys and onto the hilltop with you. And that's what I'm doing here now at Nami the Cab. Next slide. Advocating for mental health in my community. Started as a vice president, moved on currently to the president and just doing bigger and better things every single day in this community that I love. And there's no better feeling of feeling just important meeting someone at the barbershop talking about mental illness and it's somebody very influential that thought about me thought about bringing me here little old david kendrick who about 10 years ago was thinking about hurting other people and himself now has people respecting me because i'm a somebody back a couple slides ago when i was feeling like nobody low and low to overcome those, and while I'm still dealing with my own mental illnesses, and able to uh, now I'm able to contribute to the community, able to help my veterans get, get certified in NAMI Homefront. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Why this is so important to me. When I saw my mom's face, when I woke up out of that hospital, and the pain in her eyes, I said, if I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure no other parent feels this. Because in the veteran population, 17 veterans a day die from suicide. 17 moms a day have to get a call your son, your daughter has passed away, taking their own life. Because maybe someone just didn't know what to say. Someone didn't know how to exact, know, know how to support them. Or they didn't have a fellow veteran like myself who has been through what they've been through, who has that lived experience to be able to tell them, hey man, I joined the Army as a Calvary Scout because that was the only job available to me because I scored so low on my ASVAB. But now I have my master's degree. Life is gonna get better for you. It may not seem like that right now, but life gets better. And instead of talking to the bottle, talk to somebody who has the skills, who has the training, who has the lived experience to be able to help them and pull them out of that valley, pull them to the mountaintop. And that's what NAMI has been able to do for me. I love NAMI the Cab. Uh, I love the Cab County, but more importantly, I just love the opportunity to get up here and advocate and be part of this wonderful organization and bring change, real change to people's lives through not only mine, but all of our lived experience. Thank you.
15 minutes, we want to make sure that you feel all the warmth and love in this room for you. And the education team, uh, that program that you took, and we noticed that it was virtual because it was during COVID. So you didn't get a chance to get this. And what this is is a challenge coin that the education team and, and, and the creator that can stand up if you will. We love you. So I don't know if you all know about the, the challenge coin, but you can Google it in terms of its history for the military and where it came from and how it was used when we had soldiers that were infiltrating our lines and putting on our uniforms. And the only way that we could indicate that it was a, a, a U.S. soldier was by creating these coins. And if they had it in their pocket, then they were, they were a U.S. soldier. So what you do, and, and now law enforcement has their own and every, every, every branch of the military has it. Um, and what, what, what happens is that you, you, you get it to them in the palm of their hand. So that's what we're doing. Yes, sir, Josh Allen, number 17. I'll repeat the question because you may not hear it. Uh, Glenn asked, is the relationship changed with his siblings and, uh, and his father since so? Uh, yes, uh, yes they have dramatically. Um, something that I didn't even mention, because I knew about, I had these feelings of not having any emotion or anything like that. It took me five years, but I decided to get a vasectomy when I was 27 because I, I said, hey, I'm not having these feelings. I can't bring a child into the world like this. But now since things are better, I have a great relationship with everyone and currently have the application in with the state to adopt. But uh, <laughs> because, because now that I have a, a good grip on these emotions and I even have my own suicide prevention plan from the VA, I know when I'm down in the dumps. And I know when I need to seek help or just get away. And so I feel like I have the love that I, you know, that I didn't have back then to give to a child and start my own family. And me and my dad are good now. You know, he still gets on nerves sometimes. But every Bills game, he calls me about 20 times a day, asking me if I saw that play. And I'm like, Dad, I'm watching it too, Dad. Yes, I'm watching it. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but believe it or not, and I forgot to mention this, I had that whole portion of my life recorded on YouTube, just the, the downward spiral. And the reason that I showed that part with the weapon is because in today's age, we have so many of these mass shooters and the signs are there before it happens. And we find out after they've done something, they've done the event, that they had all the signs. All the signs were there, but we find out afterward when it's too late. Or people say, I wish I would have said something. I wish I would have did something to save all these lives. So I want to help other people. I want to help other veterans. I want to help the VA with my story. Just recognize the signs. See what they are. Because not, not too many veterans are going to get up on stage and say, hey, I thought about doing something like this. Because we have that military training and the weapons training and know how to do the schematics and make all these plans and things like that. And I'm from Rochester. You know, there was just a mass shooting in Buffalo over the summer at Tops, the grocery store. And this kid was there just doing reconnaissance, just like doing the military. So I want to help other people, other therapists, other doctors just understand the signs and, you know, hopefully save some lives in the future with my story. It's very vulnerable. It's 
honestly embarrassing as hell, but if it can save lives, <laughs> thank you. First of all, thank you for your story. Thank you for sharing to all of us. And I found so many parallels, so many intersections that I found familiar, and I didn't wear a uniform growing up. So I'm wondering how successful or how effective have you been in sharing your story with other young black men, young in communities around the country. I'm from DC. I remember growing up thinking that there's, there's no one coming to save us, east of the river, southeast of Harvest City area of the city um but again what you describe whether it's the you know the emotion the, the challenges the the violence the mental emotional pain and, and stress and then all of the influences that that coincide to create that stress again can happen without the uniform so i'm wondering how successful or effective have you been with sharing your story your experiences with young black men who aren't wearing uniforms that's a great, great question. And we're slowly getting there through things like the Confession Project, uh, which uh, gives barbers the skills to talk to their clients. As you can see, I spend a lot of time in the barber, you know. Uh, but really, it's sharing my own story and meeting them where they are on their level, talking about football or, or talking about the local rap artists now, even most of them now are trash. But talk, <laughs> talking about talking about things that they can relate to, and then slowly working my way in, because see, with, with my story, you know, we have a lot of moms, and you know, our moms gonna take us to church, our grandmas gonna take us to church, because you know, back in the day when they grew up, church was the doctor, and now we have actual doctors that we can go to. And so let, letting these people know, hey man, it, it's okay to get the help that you need. I did it. I'll even I'll go there with you. But sometimes you have to meet them where they are because in the African American community, it's easier to find a gun, a blunt, or a bottle of alcohol than somebody to help you with, with what you really need. And we don't and, and once it's there, we don't want it because it's easier to spend five dollars and numb the pain temporarily rather than take care of it permanently. So I'm working on it every single day. I just got contacted by DeKalb County NAACP to get in their community um, and just talk to young black men, young black women, share my story, let them know exactly what I'm going through and just that things get better. Things get better through my lived experience. Thank you for your service and sharing your story with us as well. Um, my question is, you just briefly mentioned when you got shot that another soldier threw his body over you. Did he survive? And have you been able to talk with him about some of your your struggle? And where's he at right now? He did. Uh, Sergeant Kevin Bailey, back then, a great guy. Uh, we talked a lot when we were back at Fort Carson, because we were still in the same unit in Rear D. And so he told me exactly what happened, because when I hit the ground, I blacked out. And I don't remember getting hit in my other leg. And he told me everything that happened. And uh, put, it, put it in my book and everything like that. But it, it's one of those bonds that you have for a lifetime. You know, so you'll be a, he'll be a brother for life, and we do talk. And me and my other battle buddies, we have a group and we talk every single day, all the time. We try to help each other as much as we can. Um, one of my good friends, he's actually still in the Army. I think he's a Sergeant Major now. While the rest of us got out, you know, I'm doing my speaking thing and other, my other friends went to go on and get their different degrees and things of that nature. But we, we do talk because that trauma and those lived experiences in combat is what bring us together as well. And some of the same things that I'm going through or that I've been through our police officers go through the same thing because you have some officers that are a little bit crazy like I was and want to be out I think in the field in the patrol cars 
and they see things that the average person doesn't see while protecting us. So it's just, you know, you have a lot of veterans that go on to be police officers because they still want that thrill, they still want to chase that adrenaline rush, or they still have the need just to serve. So we have a lot in common just through our combat experiences and for, and for our boys in blue, you know, the experiences that they see patrolling the streets. Yeah, got another question here. First, thank you. Uh, second, go Bills. Um, and, uh, you know, you talked just a little bit, you know, it took you a long time to find NAMI. And you always talk about people find it too late. They wish they had found us sooner. Can you talk a little bit about how you found NAMI, how you got connected, and what we can be doing to, to get in people's lives sooner? Okay. Well, while I was climbing my hill, um, I, I got in, well, I graduated from a program called the United Way VIP program. And what this program does in Atlanta, it teaches people how to be nonprofit board members. And they will also, uh, they have a, a board or a, uh, they send out an email blast highlighting the nonprofit board positions that are open in the area. And I saw NAMI the Cab, and I saw you know National Alliance of Mental Illness. And since I had the training, decided to join. And what I found out since I've been on the board um, we're doing better and better when it comes to getting in, in the community. Um, within the CAD, we had a, last year we had a big multicultural mental health fair. And just knowing what demographics need help the most. Because uh, mental health, it doesn't, ma it doesn't matter what race you are, what your age is, what your religion is, you know, what your background is. We all go through stuff. We all go through stuff. And I, I think luckily I found NAMI but we're doing a better job through our volunteers and recruiting of just getting in different, different demographics that need assistance. Because we have a very diverse culture within DeKalb County. So we have some, uh, we have a, uh, I just attended a, a panel for uh, refugees who are coming from different countries and things of that nature. I'm sorry if that's not the politically correct term, I'm sorry if it's not, but, um, Knowing the, the stigmas in different cultures, because we, we are so selfish, and well so, because we have a lot of stuff going on in our own world that we don't tend to think about, hey, well, I wonder what people from, I don't know, Somalia, how they deal with mental health, or somebody from Korea, what they do with mental health, or what their stigma is. So it's just having a great team of volunteers, a diverse group of people, getting into those groups, and just figuring out what programs and assistance we can provide, and doing things like our big walk at the Georgia State Capitol next month, uh, October 15th. And uh, my team, the Cap Pacers, I'll be out there up front advocating for, for NAMI. Yes. Yes. Hold on. This is Stephen the Young. <laughs> no, I know I'm between y'all and food, so. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dan. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like on the other side of the room. So, I had a question for you. Um, as an aspiring counselor myself, to you know, be in the mental health field, you know, from someone who's had lived experience and talks to a lot of other folks who have lived experience, what it, are there any things that you wish more counselors knew, more counselors understood about PTSD, about working with veterans, or any of the other communities you know that you uh, identify with and, and talk to people about? I think. The Army now, and I think the military as a whole today, it's not what it was back in 2006, 2007, when I was in. So we did, our, we did things in secret. You know, we drank in secret, and we, we only hung with soldiers who drank or, you know, took a bunch of Percocets and things like that. I think my, what my one friend that told me about the military culture that's still in now, people are more willing to be able to tell their stories, but it, it takes some sharing on both sides. Like, hey, I've been through this, I've been there. Um, in the African American community, people want a doctor that looks like them because they feel like they can share those same experiences and things of that nature. So you may get some pushback, you may have somebody who wants to change doctors um, because I, I found not only in the African American community, but people wanted to talk to people who look like them, who think like them, and I think it's more on us to realize that you guys are the professionals. You guys just don't sign up to serve 
African Americans or or men or women or whoever's in you know the LGBTQ plus community. I think it's up to us as patients to realize that anybody can help us. You know, it doesn't matter what that person looks like. Um, you can share your lived experience, a little bit of it with, with your future patients. But I think just like the customer isn't always right, <laughs> not all patients are gonna be good patients. Some people, they'll see somebody and think, oh, this person can't help me. Not knowing your own lived experience or what you've been through or, or, or your background. So what I found that has helped me is sharing a little bit about yourself in a bio. Uh, we call them fun, fun facts, you know, something that separates you from the profession a little bit to show people that, you know, you are an actual person. Because I know I've been afraid to share when I was going through everything that you saw earlier, I was afraid to share those thoughts because I didn't want to get a 1013 and then, you know, be just thrown in the back of a paddy wagon, as they call them, and then not be able to see anybody for the next two weeks. So it's just slowly breaking down that barrier with whoever you're trying to talk to, you know, and having a two-way conversation instead of, you know, just being behind the pen and writing everything down, just having an actual conversation with, with somebody. Any other questions? All right, well, David, um, yeah, thank you. David mentioned the Confess Project, and the Confess Project is the black man's barbershop. And as you all heard me say at the opening, I met David at the barbershop. And this is my first time hearing his entire story. What I heard there was, at the barbershop, was tone. I heard the post-traumatic stress disorder. I heard him had been shot by a sniper, and I heard Rochester. But his tone, and I trusted that his his story would be something that we would be able to uh, relate to. And that trust allowed me to sit there and hear it for the first time along with all of you all. And if you look at this picture right here, this says it all about what he cares about. <laughs> so we just want to say thank you for being here with us. Thank you for trusting us with your story. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I'm trying to help as many people as I can.